Mexico Star Theater. The more than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast welcome you to an hour of mirth and melody with our star comedian, Fred Allen. Kenny Baker and Portland Hopper. Our guest, Mr. James Gallagher, the Sandhog. The Martins and Al Goodman's Orchestra. It's Texaco time. Gentlemen, now look, Jimmy, before we start, what was that in person Fred Allen introduction? You know, brevity is all right in its place, but after all, you are not introducing a singer midget here. Oh, didn't like? Too bad. Now, Mr. Wallington, will you kindly stop sounding like a Scotch telegram for a minute? <laughs> what goes on with you? Fred, this is National Threat Week. I'm merely being thrifty with your introduction and all my conversations. GB. GB. Goodbye. Well, I know what's wrong with that guy. He's still sore about that award he got last week. The radio voice most likely to bring back the phonograph. <laughs> Only two days ago, I paid to have a cavity in his molar filled so his commercials wouldn't have an echo, and this is the thanks I get. <laughs> National Thrift Week. Well, oh, hello, Kenny. Hi, F. Kenny. The initials are F.A. Yes, F. Uh, Kenny, don't tell me that you, too, are celebrating Thrift Week. Yes, F. Well, does this exhaust your conversation? Yes, F. TV. <laughs> well, before the whole program turns out to be a soliloquy, we'll take up the latest news of the week. Mr. Goodman, a fanfare, please. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mr. Goodman, for that Thrift Week blast you just uh, released there. However, the Texaco News presents its highlights from the world of news. <laughs> New York City, New York. The National Retail Dry Goods Association of America names winner of its contest to select Mrs. Typical Customer of 1941. Mrs. Clementine Phil of La Crosse, Wisconsin, has given a free trip to New York City and an extended shopping tour as photographers, reporters, and dry goods tycoons tag along to study her reactions. Tonight, the Texaco News, not to be outdone, chronicles the doings of the winner of the Texaco News Average Man Contest. On January 15th, the Average Man Contest closed. On the morning of the 16th, the president of the Texaco News Contest Board announced... Texaco News selects as Mr. Average Man for 1941, Aubrey Babbitt of Upper Sandusky, Ohio. A telegram was rushed to Aubrey Babbitt, and the next morning, Aubrey said to his wife, uh, I gotta go to New York, Bueller. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> and his wife said to Aubrey, uh, Goodbye. <laughs> Well, 
after after this touching farewell, Aubrey Babbitt zipped up his duffel bag, was off to the nearest bus station on his way to fame and New York City. As Aubrey swung off the bus at Times Square with his duffel bag, he was surrounded by a battery of newspaper photographers. There he is. Smile, Aubrey. There you are, smile. Stand up, Aubrey. No, okay, I'll stand up. Sit down, Aubrey. Do, okay, I'll sit down. Roll over, Aubrey. Do, hey, wait a <laughs> Aubrey was finally rescued by the Texaco News official greeter and packed off to a little hotel just off Times Square. Reporters and gossip columnists watched as Aubrey checked in. America would want to know what Mr. Average Man was going to want in the way of hotel rooms for 1941. Pencils and pads were ready as Aubrey, his duffel bag carelessly slung over his shoulder, approached the desk. The hotel clerk spoke. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? Uh, I want a room. An outside room? If you got a room inside, I'd rather have it. <laughs> I see. You uh, want water, of course? The, uh, give me a room with the well. Reporters rushed to phones with their first flashes on the coming trend. Mr. Average Man for 1941 wanted a room with a well. Every hotel in America would have to rip out its plumbing and install wells. As soon as Aubrey had unzipped his duffel bag, he was interviewed by a sob sister from one of New York's leading dailies. What's your name, mister? The Aubrey Babbitt. Where do you live? The Upper Sandusky, Ohio. What business are you in, Mr. Babbitt? The, I've been the Upper Sandusky muskrat catcher nine years. Uh, what do you do with the muskrat? The, I don't know. I ain't caught one yet. <laughs> the instant this hangnail description of his life was finished, Aubrey was rushed away on a shopping tour. Reporters followed along to see what Mr. Average Man would wear in 1941. At New York's leading tailors, they heard Mr. Babbitt say... Uh, uh, give me a herring bone suit with a Norfolk jacket and uh, three pair of pants. Three pair of pants? Uh, yeah, I got two brothers. Now, you've got three pair of pants, two brothers, and only one jacket. How do you divide it up? Uh, we take times wearing the coat. His suit purchased... <laughs> His suit purchased, the reporter scurried after Mr. Average Man to Macy's underwear department. Here they heard him say... Uh, look, have you got one of them National Defense Union suits? National Defense Union suit? Uh, yeah, it's double-breasted. It keeps out the draft. <laughs> Mr. Average Man had picked America's underwear. What about America's shoes? The reporters were all ears, as Mr. Babbitt said to the shoe dealer. Okay, uh, uh, give me that high tan button shoe and that yellow sneaker. Shall I wrap these, Mr. Babbitt? The, no, put the shoe on my right foot. The, the sneaker goes on my left. Do you always wear a shoe on your right foot and a sneaker on your left? Uh, yeah, you see, my right foot keeps falling asleep. And with the sneaker on... My left foot don't make no noise. My right foot can keep on sleeping. <laughs> America's shoe style set, Mr. Babbitt turned to the hat problem. The hat salesman said... Here are the latest styles, Mr. Babbitt. Uh, no, let me see. Uh... How would you like a beret? Uh, no. How would I... you like a derby? Uh, no, my ears are too weak. The derby keeps slipping down. Well, uh, how would you like a humber? With onions. <laughs> After Mr. Average Man had set the sartorial styles for 1941, he stepped into a chain cigar store. The tobacco trade stood with bated breath. The tobacco auctioneer might be caught with his chance down. <laughs> what? What would Mr. Average Man smoke for 1941? Without an instant's hesitation, Aubrey said, uh, Give me a good five cent cigar. This is a chain store, sir. The five cent cigars are four cents. So, uh, how much are the ten cent cigars? Eight cents each, two fifteen. Uh, have you got any cigars? The three for 15? Yes, sir. The nine-cent panatellas, which are six cents straight, sell three for 15. Well, here's a nickel. Give me one of them. I'm sorry, sir. I can't break up a set. Well, what can you get for a nickel in a cigar store today? A phone call. The booth is to your left. <laughs> Mr. Average Man finally gave up, and as he left the tobacco mark, he was heard to say... Yo, what this country needs is a good five-cent cigar that sells for five cents. Mr. Average Man finally enjoyed a short smoke on a butt he sniped when the press wasn't looking. Then he was off pell-mell to a show. As he stepped out of the theater where he had just seen a rousing, rip-roaring performance of Hamlet, one of the reporters said... How did you like Hamlet, Mr. Babbitt? Uh, 
If you guys didn't have a half Nelson on me, uh, I'd have gone to Minsky's. Later that night, after he made the round of stuffy New York nightclubs, Mr. Average Man turned to the reporters and said... Uh, excuse me. I'm going down into this sewer and get some fresh air. Since America wanted to know how Mr. Average Man reacted to street mendicants, a panhandler was asked to approach our hero. The panhandler oozed up to Aubrey and whined. Hey, buddy, will you give me a dime for a cup of coffee? Uh, no, thanks. I never drink coffee this late. It keeps me awake. And with this, Mr. Average Man was off to bed. The next morning, his tour finished. He was bustled on to a bus, eager and anxious to return to his simple average American home in Upper Sandusky, Ohio. As the bus pulled out, the Herald Tribune reporter, eager for a last word from Mr. Average Man for 1941, shouted, How did you like New York? And Aubrey Babbitt of Upper Sandusky, Ohio, proved beyond a doubt that he was Mr. Average Man when he made this scintillating reply. Uh, New York is all right to visit, <laughs> But I wouldn't live here on a bet, Lord. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Kenny Baker, who is above the average in his melodic profession, stalks to his personal microphone to sing, I Hear a Rhapsody. <laughs> Say, Jimmy. Yes, Fred? Say, I meant to ask you before, what is that dangling on your wrist there? A new uh, new kind of wristwatch? Oh, no. This is a radio, Fred. That little thing, a radio? Yes, it's the latest thing out. It's the smallest portable radio in the world. Gosh, a radio that small? It looks as though if you tuned in Amos and Andy, you'd only get uh, Amos on a thing that small. <laughs> if you listen to the Lone Ranger, you'd only get Hi-Ho. <laughs> They'd have to mail you the silver, I mean... <laughs> 
Oh, no. no. This radio really works, Fred. I'll tune in and show you, huh? Well, that's as nice a static concert as I've ever heard, Jimmy. Shh, I'm getting something now. Wait a minute. Oh, shucks. Guess it won't work tonight. One of the tubes must be a dud. Well, that is the smallest dud I have ever heard of, Mr. Wallington. Yes, Fred. But even a small dud can cause trouble. You see, Fred, just as this dud tube ruined my reception, it's the duds, those useless slow-action elements in gasoline, that are responsible for those slow starts that wear down your battery on cold days. Duds deaden those few ounces of chilled gasoline, which are all your carburetor holds, all your motor depends on for a quick start. It's because duds just won't take the spark that starters grind and grind and batteries take a beating. So it's good news for driver and battery both that there are no duds in Texaco Fire Chief. They're out. All out. Removed by a special refining process. That's why Fire Chief comes through with flashing starts, powerful acceleration, quick warm-up. For cold weather dependability, try a Texaco dealer and famous Fire Chief. It's all action. Not a dud in a tank full. Too far over, Mr. Goodman, your bridge, remember. Uh, Mr. <laughs> it slips out of the <laughs> but Mr. Goodman and his musette ensemble <laughs> have just played Andalusia from the Spanish province of the same name. And now, ladies and gentlemen, come in. Mr. Allen? Yes? I did it again, and I'm glad, glad, glad! <laughs> you remember me? Yes, I uh, do have the misfortune to remember you. You are the sound man. Yeah. Now, last week, you busted in here yelling, I'm glad, I'm glad, and that you wanted to see what the other side of your door looked like. That's right. Well, what is it you want tonight? Did any fan mail come in for me? No. Now, are you glad, glad, glad? Oh, I'm sad, sad, sad. <laughs> what a program. The sound man wants fan mail, a crying sound man. The next thing, the man who sweeps up the studio will want Billy. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, our guest... Oh, hello, Portland. Hello. Can I use your microphone for a minute? For what? I want to make an important announcement. An announcement about what? The March of Dimes. Oh, for the Infantile Paralysis Fund? Yes. I want to 
remind everybody to send their dimes in right away. Oh, are you on the March of Dimes Committee? Yes. I'm also on the Anti-Noise Committee. Oh, well, that's fine. And now our guest... Oh, uh, we're going to make New York 100% quiet. Good. Well, you can help the cause by piping down right now. <laughs> we're going to make self-bowling alleys so you can't hear a pin drop. Now, look, Portland, we don't... Well, look, we don't... We're going to make all bookstores take the din out of Gunga Din. Well, that's very nice, but at the moment I... And we're going to take all the noise out of nursery rhymes. The noise out of nursery rhymes? Well, how do you mean? Well, in Little Boy Blue, he's not going to blow his horn. You mean the, the Anti-Noise League is going to rewrite Little Boy Blue so that he doesn't blow his horn? Well, how is it going to sound? I'll show you. Little Boy Blue, come back in your sheep. Don't blow your horn, not even a peep. Tell your sheep to come tiptoe out of the thicket. If they make any noise, will you get a ticket? Well, that's a good uh, anti-noise poem. There was no noise after it. I mean, I think... <laughs> Well, you can always get the hint, you know. We, we never hint. On, you misunderstood the whole thing there. The whole. Thing. Well, have you fin- Have you finished, Portland? Yes. Good. Now, please tell me who is our guest tonight. He's a sand hog. A sand hog? Mm-hmm. You mean he's one of the men who has helped to build the tunnels under New York and the Hudson River? That's right, Mr. Allen. Meet the president of the Sand Hog Union, Mr. James Gallagher. Well, that's fine. Oh, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Gallagher. Good evening, Fred. I've always been interested in your colorful profession, Mr. Gallagher. Now, Uncle Jim tells me that officially you are the president of Local 147 of the Compressed Air and Free Air Tunnels, Foundations, Caisson, Subway Sewer, Cofferdam Construction Workers Union. I am, Fred. But boiled down, it comes out... The Sandhogs Union. The Sandhogs Union. Well, before we go any farther, Mr. Gallagher, what is a sand hog? Any man who works on the compressed air, where he is a carpenter, miner, welder, is a sand hog, Fred. And all tunnel work is done under compressed air. That is right. Well, is this because most of the tunnels here in New York City are built under rivers? Yes, where men are digging a hole through the mud. The compressed air keeps the mud from Pouring in on them. Oh, I see. The the compressed air at a, at a certain uh, at a certain pressure holds the mud back, and it can't come in the excavation. Well, working under that air pressure must be a dangerous business. Yes, it is, Fred. There are only about two thousand sandhogs in the entire country. And how long have you been plying this perilous trade, Mister Gallagher? Twenty six years. Twenty six years. Well, what are some of the subterranean projects you have helped to uh, complete around Manhattan? I worked on the Holland Tunnel, the Lincoln Tunnel, and the Queens Midtown Tunnel. What about the subways? <clears throat> I worked on the 6th Avenue, 7th, and 8th Avenue subway tunnels. Say, you've been in holes more often than Dick Tracy, haven't you? <laughs> well, tell me, how, uh, how do you go about building a tunnel? I mean, after the politicians get through arguing about the cost, and you fellas really get down to work. Well, first we sink a shaft on one end of the river, and the bottom, we install the shield, and the sand hogs work in. The sand hogs work in a shield? Well, what is this shield? It's a long tube of iron, <clears throat> as wide as a tunnel, with a cutting edge on one end, pushed forward by hydraulic jacks. And as the sand hogs dig, they push this shield ahead of them. Is that yes, right? Fred. Until the tunnel is finally cut through. Well, how fast does this shield move ahead? The average about two and one half foot every four hours. Or say, two and a half feet every four hours. Why, that's faster than the traffic goes through the tunnel when you've got it finished. (laughs) Yes, Fred. Well, do you always work under compressed air in the shield? Yes, Fred. And the work was on 24 hours a day. Well, tell me, how long can you work down there? A sandhog usually works... Three hours a day and two shifts. 
Three hours a day and two shifts. An hour and a half shift, I guess. And how much time does he have in between shifts to recuperate? Four hours. Four? Well, is the air difficult to breathe? No, it is just the opposite. Compressed air makes you work hard and very fast, but it knocks you out very quickly. Well, tell me, can a worker come right out of compressed air into normal ozone, or is that physically impossible, Mr. Gallagher? It is, Fred. After a man quits work, he has to stay in the decompression chamber for three quarters of an hour. Well, what would happen if a sand hog strolled out before his decompression time was up? He probably gets a bend or some other compressed air illness. Well, no wonder there are only 2,000 sand hogs in the, in the entire com- uh, country, rather. You, uh, you have to be a superman to even start to do this work. The sand hogs is proud of its profession, Fred. All of us in the union are always trying to <clears throat> make working conditions safer. But it's part of our job to take chances. Well, I hope eventually your union will get things so well organized underground, Mr. Gallagher, that even the moles down there will be carrying union cards. (laughs) Thanks, Fred. You know, there's one thing about tunnel building that has always mystified me, Mr. Gallagher. What is that, Fred? Well, when you fellas dig a tunnel now, you don't start from one side and work across, do you? No, we start at the bottom end... And meat and the metal. Well, that's what baffles me, you see. How is it that you never miss? What do you mean? Well, when you dug the Holland Tunnel, for instance, how was it your two gangs didn't pass each other? (laughs) Now, how come one group of sand hogs didn't wind up in Hoboken and the other boys come out in Gimbel's basement? (laughs) How, uh... How did you both manage to meet at a given spot under the river? The engineers have all figured out, Fred. We have never been off more than a quarter of an inch. Well, that's just what we do in radio, Mr. Gallagher. You and I have finished our interview, and here we are. We're only off a quarter of a minute. Is that good? It's phenomenal, Mr. (laughs) Gallagher. And thank you a lot for this brief glimpse into your fascinating profession. You know, it's curious to think that for 20 years, you and I have, uh, uh, in a way, both been doing the same thing. How is that, Fred? Well, you as a sand hog have been making tunnels while I've been working as a comedian. But all our lives, we've both been boring for a living. Good night, Fred. Gentlemen, the Martins, an assortment of boys and girls, banded together for the sole purpose of advancing swing, further their crusade with a Hugh Martin version of La Cucaracha. <laughs> Like a 
Gibraltar. Martin sing La Cucaracha from the Flit Parade, number seven on the Flit Parade. And now... Yes, pardon me, Mr. Allen. May I see you a moment? It's a matter of life and death. Life and death? Yes, yes, here's my card. Oh, your card? This is your very own card? Yes, yes, yes. Let yes. me see. The print is so small. I can... Would you... Uh, Cuthbert C. Clabber, vice president in charge of publicity, conglomerated kerosene lamp companies of America. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, what has this got to do with life and death? Well, ever since those pesky electric lights came in, Mr. Allen... The kerosene lamp business has been dying. Yeah. You and only you can bring it back to life. Well, how? By giving the kerosene lamp uh, publicity, Mr. Allen. You told a joke about a zipper one week. Zippers went right to the top. You mentioned pogo sticks. Pogo sticks went ahead by leaps and bounds. Now, if you'd only tell a few jokes about lamps, we'll burn well, them no, up. I'm I, sorry. I, I, oh, no, uh, I'm sorry. I see your point. I'd like to talk it over with you during the weekend. But uh, I have to say... <laughs> I have to say no, friend. Uh, and I'll tell you why, uh, Mr. Clabber. Uh, we uh, try to keep our jokes up to date around here. Now, we don't tell jokes about mustache cups or buggy whips, and your smoky old kerosene lamp kind of falls into the same category. Oh. It, uh, it doesn't mean a thing. Oh, I'd like to differ with you, Fred. Oh, you would, Mr. Wallington? Yes, I certainly would, Fred. Well, differ then. In smoking lamps and smoking automobiles, there is a lesson all motorists should heed. Smoke means trouble. For smoke, puffing from the exhaust pipe of a car can be a sign of excessive engine wear. Then, things have gone too far for anything but a costly repair job to correct. So if you value your car, don't let it become a smoker. Change now to insulated Haviland motor oil and help reduce excessive wear in your engine. Wear due to heat, wear due to cold, and wear due to oil impurities. For Haviland stands up under today's high engine temperatures, which can break down ordinary oils and accelerate wear. It flows freely, too, at low temperatures, sparing engines the friction and wear of cold starts. Insulated Haviland is also distilled to remove carbon-forming impurities. Steer clear of smoke and trouble. Change to Insulated Haviland at any Texaco dealer. The Texaco Star Theater continues after a brief pause for your station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York. As you walk by, a last-minute substitution for frenesy, <laughs> played by Al Goodman and his gas station grenadiers. And Mr. Goodman? You are calling I. Goodman? Yes, I. Goodman, I am calling you. I just want to tell you how happy we are to have you back in the Texaco Star Theater after your absence on sick leave last week. I. Goodman, in all sincerity, thanking you. Well, that's all right. Don't mention it, Maestro. Also for the fruit, Goodman is thanking you. Say, it, it did look pretty, didn't it? Looking, it is pretty. But tasting, it is fooey. <laughs> well, don't tell me you ate that basket of fruit. Goodman is eating six bananas. But that was wax fruit, Maestro. That I'm finding out suddenly on the seventh banana. <laughs> you found out that it was wax fruit how? The seventh banana I'm deciding to peel. <laughs> well, it's a wonder you didn't get heartburn Heartburn I am getting In Goodman's stomach, the seven wax bananas are burning like candles <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, Maestro, I didn't... Uh... Welcome back, Mr. Goodman Thank you, Porty How do you feel? Thanks to you, Porty, Goodman is better The soup is doing the trick What soup? Porty is sending me piping hot a container of soup Mr. Goodman! I am drinking it to the last drop. But that wasn't soup. Well, what did you send him? A hot water bottle. <laughs> Not only hot, but delicious. <laughs> what a guy. He eats seven wax bananas, drinks the water out of a hot water bottle, doesn't wait for his laugh. <laughs> 
And no wonder you were sick. This is making me sick. I was sick two days before already. Were you very sick, Mr. Goodman? 24 hours a day, I'm sneezing. Day and night, an intern is standing by just saying good night. <laughs> Did you have many visitors? Constantly it is visitors. Friends are coming in leaving fruit. Relatives are coming in eating it. Well, how long did this mob keep running in, this vitamin-minded mob keep running in and out, uh, Mr. Goodman? Till Dr. Pincus is putting on the door a sign. Then Goodman is alone. What does the sign say? One word, Clementine. Clementine? Yes, a girl's name. It is fooling everybody. But inside that room is still Goodman. Now, uh, look, you mean quarantine, not Clementine, my girl. Quarantine, he says. It's a mouthwash. <laughs> Your night school teacher, Fosdick Feinschreiber, should be here now. <laughs> now, look, Mr. Goodman. When you have a contagious malady, a quarantine sign is put up on the door so that people will stay out. Who's staying out? The first day, two Spaniards are coming in and sitting down. Two Spaniards? What did they say? When is the news real? Two Spaniards came into your hospital room, sat down, and said, When is the news real? What was that? Who knows? In Spanish, quarantine maybe means translux. <laughs> well, that, of course, was an accident. After the quarantine sign was up, nobody came to see you on purpose. Only Kenny Baker, my pal. Kenny Baker? Well, I guess Kenny doesn't know what quarantine means. Yes, he does. Kenny is deliberately trying to get sick, Mr. Allen. Oh, that's silly. Why should he want to get sick? Kenny saw all the sympathy in the presents Mr. Goodman got. Imagine that guy going into Goodman's sick room. He even got into Mr. Goodman's sick bed. Trying to catch what Goodman had, huh? Yes, but it didn't work. I guess Kenny is just too healthy. Well, either that or Goodman's germs are too weak to go on location. <laughs> Well, it serves Kenny right. Hello, F.A. Oh, hi. Hi, Kenny. Hello, Kenny. Hello, Porty. Epidemic weather, isn't it? <laughs> well, what's epidemic about it? Fresh, crisp air? How do I look? Pretty bad, huh? Gosh, Kenny, I think you look wonderful. That's a fine thing to tell an invalid. An invalid? Why, you're in the pink of condition, Kenny. You look like a draft board's dream. <laughs> I do? Why, you look as robust and as vigorous. Why, why you could be, as you stand there now, you could be Banar McFadden as a little boy. <laughs> Gee, that's funny. Why? I feel good, too. You want to be happy, Kenny. Has everybody got to catch a train or something? <laughs> yeah, uh, you ought to be happy, yes. How would you like to be Mr. Goodman, Kenny? <laughs> time out, time out. <laughs> If you go too fast, I have to waste the time some way. We'll all just be... We'll all be standing around here for eight minutes at the end of the program with nothing to do. <laughs> Never mind where we were. Where are we? Yes, you should be happy. How would you like to be Mr. Goodman? Flat on his back all week. Thirty years a musician. For the first time, Goodman is flat. <laughs> Quiet, please, maestro. You've got your health, Kenny. What more do you want? If I was sick, people would bring me presents. <laughs> Kenny Baker, you mean to say you're deliberately trying to get sick to get a few measly presents? Who's deliberately trying? You are. I saw you coming to the studio barefoot in all that snow. Kenny... Well, my shoes were wet, so I took them off. I didn't want to catch cold. And he tried to catch Tobane, too, Mr. Allen. He did, hey? What did you eat, you infection beta? Oh, nothing. Just a pickled small tearing with whipped cream. <laughs> Who would serve you in this horrible combination? The waiter was a friend of mine. Kenny Baker, you are lying. Just a minute. Who is insulting Kenny Baker, Goodman's best friend? What do you mean, your best friend? When I am sick, Kenny is taking care of me better than my own brother. Your own brother, Mr. Goodman? My own brother. That's for me. Come in. Hello, Joe. Hello, Al. Joe, when I was sick, 
You could take better care of me than Kenny Baker did? No. So long, Joe. So long, Al. <laughs> there, that was my own brother. <laughs> Your own? You're afraid the podium will cool off, eh? <laughs> Get back there in time. Your own brother. Let me tell you, Mr. Goodman, that actor with the five o'clock shadow on his scalp is related to anybody on this program who will give him half of a joke. <laughs> Why don't you tell Mr. Goodman the truth, Mr. Ballard? I shall. Mr. Goodman, look, Kenny was only hanging around you to catch your cold. What's wrong with taking my cold? Could my own brother do more than that? Your own brother? My own brother. Portland, please. Never mind. Don't open that door. <laughs> Your point needs no illustration. This with me is optional. <laughs> Don't you understand? Kenny didn't care about you or your condition. He just wanted to get sick himself so he could get some sympathy and some presents. This Kenny Baker is true? Yes, Mr. Goodman. I ought to go someplace and be ashamed of myself. Hey, you see? Why, Kenny, you don't know how lucky you are in a pinker condition. You're right, F.A. It's good to be healthy. Say, wait a minute. You know, you don't look so good at that, uh, now that I take a good look at you. Gee, I don't. No, your eyelids look heavy, Kenny. Kenny looks all right to me. Quiet, Portland. You know, Kenny, your face is positively pale. Stick out your tongue. At who? No. <laughs> no, just, uh, just stick it out on speculation. All right, fair. Is it white? Is it white? Your tongue looks like a ghost's necktie, Kenny. You are a sick man. Portland, you better rush out and call an ambulance. All right, Mr. Allen. When the ambulance comes, look, look under it and say hello to my lawyer. <laughs> One line you've got to get to laugh, so you put a, a new verb in the middle. <laughs> when the ambulance comes, looks under it. <laughs> gets lonesome looking under it alone. <laughs> well, quiet, Mr. Goodman. Now, Kenny... Oh, wait a minute, F.A. I'm not sick, Oh, really. yes, you are. You... Honest, I'm not. Now, don't talk so loud, Kenny. You're weak, remember. Conserve your strength. No, I'm not weak. I'm strong. Strong, he says. I'll prove it. I'll get up on that bandstand and stand on my hands. Uh, and not in your condition, Kenny. Now, don't be ridiculous. Come down from there. I'll show you. Gosh, Mr. Allen, Kenny is really standing on his hands. Look, F.A. Now, all right, all right. Come down here. You're not sick. I just wanted to teach you a lesson. Look, nothing holding me up but my two hands. Now, come down before something happens. And watch out for those instruments. Look, Mr. Allen, one hand. Kenny, for Pete's sake. Look, Mr. Allen, no hand. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Kenny Baker, who has finally earned some sympathy and for the next year will be visiting his dentist twice a day, gums his way through, drink to me only with thine eyes.
If I may wax rhapsodical, your singing tonight, Kenny, is as bracing as a winter wind, as smooth as snow, as slick as a sheet of ice. Oh, stop it, will you, Alan? Cut out all that talk about winter. You're driving me bolty. Bolty? That's nutty with knobs on it. (laughs) What's uh, What's your trouble, friend? Are you allergic to winter? I hate winter. The very mention of the word gives me the droops. Snow and ice make my flesh crawl. Ah, oh, but even if you don't enjoy winter weather, friend, you can at least enjoy the winter sports. Winter sports, bad. What's skiing? You slide down and you climb up. What's skating? You stand up and you fall down. What's tobogganing? You start down and you turn over. What's... Well, we... No, we get... Uh, don't... Uh, we get the idea, neighbor. You just don't like winter. But regardless, there's one thing you should enjoy about winter if you drive a car. Oh, yeah? What is it? Our expert here on winter weather, Mr. Larry Elliott, will tell you. Just wait there a minute, friend. Yes, neighbor, there is one thing a motorist enjoys on wintry days, and that is to step inside his car, slam the door on the outside cold, press the starter, and step right out under power. And Texaco dealers can promise you that kind of brilliant performance with Sky Chief. They're different premium gasoline. Yes, stop at the Sky Chief pump. Let Sky Chief's flexible power, its surging response, be your answer to the weather. You want quick takeoffs? Sky Chief snaps your engine into life. Want fast acceleration? Sky Chief steps up the power output briskly, serenely. And that feeling of smooth, flowing power stays with you despite steep hills, despite slow traffic, and last but not least, despite low temperatures. For driving luxury this winter, try Sky Chief. It's your Texaco dealer's premium gasoline for those who want the best. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Texaco Workshop Players. Tonight, they dramatized for you a Hollywood episode that was recently filched from the wastebasket of a prominent gossip columnist. This dull tableau is called, They Almost Junked the Junket, or A Horse Was the Star of the Studio, So the Studio Hitched Its Wagon to the Star. <laughs> Music, maestro. <laughs> Sanctum of glamour. Hollywood, land of broken hearts and promises to match. Hollywood, where stars are discovered and forgotten on the hour. In 1938, Hollywood's favorite was... Clark Gable. In 1939... Spencer Tracy. In 1940... Mickey Rooney. And 1941... Paco, the horse. Yes. Hollywood's new 1941 favorite is Titanic Pictures' sensational equine discovery, Bucko, the glamour horse. Bucko is the talk of the nation. The dramatic critic on the Sioux Falls banner says... Yeah, nobody can tell me that Bucko's a horse. That's Lionel Barrymore down on all fours. <laughs> Timmy Tiddler, famous Hollywood critic, says... I've just seen Bucko's new picture, Kitty Fall. I'm giving it 12 bells. Here goes. <laughs> Variety, prominent theatrical weekly, says... Nag, gag, shags, bag, swag. <laughs> and so it goes. Rival picture producers are consumed with envy. Farrell Panic, famous movie mogul, says... As soon as Bucko dies, we'll film the story of his life. I don't know who will play the part. We'll probably tack a tail on Don Amici and hope for the best. (laughs) And while Bucko basks in the limelight, we find his producer, the dynamic president of Titanic Pictures, rushing about the studio, planning greater triumphs for his horse star, Bucko. We pick up the colossal F.A., about to enter his super office. 
Ah, oh, good morning, Miss Real. Good morning, Chief. Gad, what a day. I just ran off Bucko's new picture, Pony Express. It's the best thing Bucko has ever done. Does Bucko screen well in Technicolor? Colossal. He comes out a beautiful, dirty roan. With that henna fetlock, sorrel hocks, and those bay withers, Bucko looks like a fugitive from a merry-go-round. Pony Express ought to be a smash, all right. Say, that reminds me. Take a note. Yes, Chief. The title of Bucko's next picture, Haunted Saddles, has been changed. What's the new title? Love Thy Nay. <laughs> well, that's just like Love Thy Neighbor, only you've taken out the board. Don't mention Benny's name around here. <laughs> Do you want to corrode the chromium furniture in here? <laughs> God, what an idea. If Bucko's new picture goes over, he'll make a million dollars. What's money to a horse? It ain't hay. <laughs> Maybe they'll give the Academy Award in oats this year. Well, they should. They've been giving it for corn long enough. <laughs> Dad, that's an epigram. It just occurred to me. Put it down. Send it to Skolsky. Yes, Chief. I've got to pick a junket town for Pony Express right away, Miss Real. I've got to concentrate. Why do new pictures always have to have junkets? Well, the purpose of a junket is to get all of the movie critics on a train, take them to some small town, wine them and dine them, and then show them the picture. So? While the critics are out of touch with civilization, you open the picture all over the country. None of the critics are back in their hometowns to panic. So where's your junket going to be? Bucko is Hollywood's biggest star. Bucko's picture will be previewed in the biggest town. The biggest? The biggest big town in the country. Get the mayor of New York City on the phone. Yes, sir. Dad, what an idea. But how can you tie up Pony Express with New York? They have expresses in the subway, don't they? Yes. Mayor LaGuardia has just opened the new 6th Avenue subway, hasn't he? Yes. Well, his subway can use some publicity. There's our tie-up, you see. I'll have Bucko, the Pony Express... Race the Queen's Plaza Express <laughs> down in the 6th Avenue subway. Bucko can come out at 50th Street and prance through the lobby of the Roxy on opening night. Hello? Oh, yes, sir. It's the mayor of New York on the phone, I think. <laughs> Hello? Is this Washington calling? No. Oh, shucks. <laughs> This is Titanic Pictures, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'm expecting a call from Washington. Hang up. Now, now look, uh, Mr. Mayor, this call is coming from Hollywood. Just a minute. I've got no time. I'm opening a new fish market in the Bronx. I've got to throw out the first flounder. <laughs> but this is about some publicity, Mr. Mayor. Why, I... Uh, uh, oh, you mean I'll be in the newsreels? <laughs> yes, I want to preview Bucko, the Wonder Horse's new picture in New York City. A horse? Can I ride him? Yes. Oh, goody. <laughs> we want Bucko, the Pony Express, to race your Queen's Plaza Express down in the 6th Avenue subway. You will ride Bucko. Is it okay? Yes. Uh, oh, wait a minute. How do I look in a riding habit? Well, I don't know. I'll ask my secretary. How do I look in a riding habit? Oh, thank you. Well, Mr. Mayor? Shorten the stirrups and it's okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, wait a minute. You say I can ride the horse? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Then I'll ride him across the country. I'm leaving for Hollywood right away. But, Mr. Mayor... He doesn't answer. I'm at the airport. Uh, goodbye. Yeah, the mayor's a dynamo, Miss Real. That's why City Hall has to be kept near the battery. <laughs> we'll, uh... we'll have to get Bucko ready immediately for our junket. I've sent the stable a memo. Bucko's valet is getting him ready. Uh, we'll have to welcome the mayor at the airport, too, Miss Real. Take a note. Yes, sir. Now, the mayor lives in New York City. We've got to make him feel at home out here in California. When he steps off the plane, have 200 riveters start riveting. Have 50 extras at the airport to shove him around. As the mayor walks along, have 20 motorists all blowing their automobile horns and 10 dirty little boys trying to sell him all the latest songs for a nickel. Yes, Chief. This pure California air will be too much for him, too. As soon as the mayor arrives, have 600 automobiles backfire and release carbon monoxide. He'll think he's back on 42nd Street. 
F.A., F.A., this is plum awful. Spavin, Bucko's valet. Why aren't you getting Bucko ready for the mayor's welcome? That horse is gone loco. I can't do nothing with him. Bucko? He's laying down in the stall. He won't get up. Bucko looks like he's dying. Why, this smacks of stallion sabotage, Spavin. What happened? Nothing. I was curry combing Bucko and saying to him, you got to look pretty, Bucko. You're going to meet Mr. LaGuardia. Yeah? He just rolled his eyes and laid down in the stall, moaning. He won't move. Where is Bucko now? Uh, he's in his mother of pearl stall on stage B. Stage B, hey? Well, let's go. And if anything happens to Bucko and we let the mayor down, our Pony Express preview will be off. Titanic will be in receivership again. I'll be back at my old job pressing Cecil B. DeMille's berets. Yes, stage B, F.A. Quiet, quiet, everybody. Where is Bucko, man? Horn critters lying there in his stall. Yeah, look at him. He's trembling. What's wrong, Bucko? <laughs> What is it? Your stomach? Did you get a bad oat at the commissary? Uh-uh. Bad bucko, you've got to buck up. Your new picture, Pony Express, is opening in New York. Our junket is leaving. Looks like he's got the horse miseries. Maybe something mental. What are you worried about, bucko? Is it your billing? Did Jimmy Fiddler write you an open letter? Well, what is it, bucko? Tell F.A. <laughs> He's looking right at me and shaking his head, F.A. Something you said to Bucko must have upset him, Spavin. What did you say? Nothing. I just mentioned something about Miss LaGuardia. What we are exact words, Spavin. The future of Titanic Pictures is at stake. What did you say to this horse? Well, I said, Bucko, today you're going to meet the finest mayor in the country. (laughs) Mayor? That's what's done it. thought he was going to meet a new girlfriend. He's bashful, you see. He went to pieces. Well, I'll be whiffletreed, Bucko's girl, sir. <laughs> now, calm down, Bucko. You're not meeting that kind of a mayor. Mm-hmm. No, no. This mayor is head of a big city. <laughs> Bucko's getting up, F.A. You stay for me. Good, and our junket is on. We leave for the airport to greet the mayor at once. Uh, where are we going after New York, F.A.? To Philadelphia. Bucko's got a date with Philly. <laughs> Shouldn't have mentioned Philly, F.A. Bucko's down again. Get up, Bucko. We'll go to Trenton instead. You won't have to keep that Philly date. <laughs> now, for Mr. Larry Elliott, a message of importance to the music lovers of this entire Western Hemisphere. This Saturday afternoon, the Texas Company invites you to hear that famous opera, Madame Butterfly sung for the first time over the air by the Metropolitan Opera Company. Madame Butterfly is replete with tuneful arias. Among them, Puccini's most famous, One Fine Day. Madame Butterfly will be the eighth Metropolitan Opera Saturday matinee, sponsored by the Texas Company over another network of 208 stations reaching the entire Western Hemisphere, the United States, Canada, and to Latin America by short wave. During intermissions, there will be the opera question forum, Milton Cross as Master of Ceremonies, and a curtain talk on Our American Way of Living by Carl Sandberg, the distinguished American poet and historian. For time and station, consult your local newspaper. Thank you, Larry, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us tonight. This is Fred Allen saying good night for the more than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast. Good night. <laughs> Columbia Broadcasting System.